Welcome. Thank you so much for being here at 10 o'clock in the morning on Monday of Dragon Con. I appreciate all of you for being here. Woo! <laughs> Um, so my name is Nancy Miarelli. I'm commonly known as Cybugs online, and I live in Ecuador. And as I was just explaining to this gentleman over here, I do insect and personalized ecological tours of Ecuador. So if, that thing, if that's something that you're interested in, uh, since we just talked about how I didn't get business cards in, in time for DragonCon, you can just Google me, Cybugs, and send me a message on any of the platforms. Um, I got my master's degree in entomology from the University of Georgia, and after I did that, that's when I moved down to Ecuador. Hello everybody, um, I am Joni Mars. Um, I also have my master's degree in entomology. Um, I'm currently a PhD student at Texas A&M University <coughs> uh, in entomology. I study uh, decapitating flies and their host manipulation of fire ants. So, uh, Which are in the talk. They are in the talk. Yes. <laughs> so uh, both of us uh, actually run a um, social media outreach and science communication um, blog called Ask an Entomologist. So we're at bug questions, so it will answer anybody's questions about bugs, and all our content is driven by questions that we get from people. So uh, yeah, we were excited that you guys are here. Thank you so much again for being here early in the morning on Monday at DragonCon. <laughs> Okay, so without further ado, we have a short presentation to show you really cool insect biology. Uh, and then afterwards, there's question and answers, and also feel free to come up and look at the live animals. So you can actually get up close and personal. It's early, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just like, we got this. Okay, so this talk and this presentation is talking all about how insects inspire our pop culture, especially with aliens, robots, monsters, etc, etc. And I found this particularly amusing because during my time at DragonCon on Facebook, there were two instances of people posting about insects mentioning that they look alien-like. And that was just on my Facebook feed while I was here. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of times we have people, we'll show them some cool bug, and they're like, oh wow, this looks like an alien. And you know, you stop and you think, actually, aliens all look like bugs. <laughs> so we've been inspired by insects for quite some time. So we have the fly, it was, you know, a great classic, depending on how you define the word great. <laughs> Uh, then we have Alien from 1979, which actually is a great example. Um, and we will see more of this coming soon. I, I'm sorry to say, but it actually does exist. This type of behavior exists in real life. And then, you know, Starship, Starship Troopers as well. <laughs> As when I was talking about this presentation, I had about three or four people be like, that's going in the presentation, right? I better. Like, I was like, I guess it is now. <laughs> so here it is, our token Starship Troopers. So to start off, we're just gonna talk a little bit about morphology. We're gonna show you some pictures of the insects and then also at the end when you get to look at the bugs, you'll really get to see kind of up close where these aliens, where these monsters, where these robots got their, you know, got their inspiration. Yeah, so um, insects have highly diverse morphology, so meaning what they look like, their body, their their heads, their thorax, their abdomen. So all insects, um, their bodies are divided into three regions: the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. But they also have highly modified they have highly modified parts <coughs> on these structures. So things like praying mantises have these raptorial forelegs, which you see a lot in um, alien monsters and movies. Another common morphology in aliens are these big giant eyes, and not all insects have big giant eyes, it's just the, the ones that you notice do, and that's because the compound eye of the insect uh, is a compound eye, and it's not exactly the best reference to say like resolution of the eye, but we're going to use that just because it's the easiest thing to compare it and basically understand the general concept. Um, but there's a famous quote that says something like, uh, evolution is just working with a 
with a terrible plan and is just trying to modify this awful design from the beginning. Because the only way to get better vision if you're an insect is to put more lenses on your head. So the only way to see better is to have giant eyes. So there's some insects that only have a couple little lenses and they're basically blind. You'll have um, flies that have about three to 4,000 lenses, and then dragonflies have about 40,000 lenses in each eye. Yes. So these compound eyes, just to, to clarify, they are comprised of like these units called omatidia, so they're like these little facets. So when Nancy's saying that it's like one, some some will have just one of those to like 40,000, which you do see in dragonflies. They're highly visual predators. And each one is effectively like a pixel, so the only way to see better is to add more pixels. We have this cute little thing. I took this picture in Ecuador, so come visit me. Uh, this is a leaf hopper with this really crazy modification. We think that it is actually mimicking an ant and looks very scary to things that aren't that like aren't people. <laughs> um, but that's the best that we can that's the best guess that we have for why it has this ornamentation. And then we have this um, caterpillar here. It's a type of swallowtail, right? This mm -hmm. type of a swallowtail caterpillar. And you see a lot of ornamentation um, on insects for a variety of reasons. Some caterpillars um, have what we call an, um, what's it called? The a pick, a, 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 a osmotarium. Osmotarium, yeah, that they use to. Um, Who's seen caterpie? The, the big Y on the top, yeah, that's the osmetarium. That actually is on real insects, real caterpillars, and they flop that out of their head, and it smells bad to deter predators. Yes, it's like, like so you see a lot of really cool structures for defenses on um, insects, and a lot of times there are aliens that have like cool ornamentation or things where they have like uh, acids being spit out or some sort of chemical and insects do have a lot of um, these structures that do things like that. And then this is the tailless whip scorpion. Um, we actually have one with us. Uh, has Who's a Harry Potter fan? Yeah, so you know in the fifth movie when Madame Moody uses the Cretaceous curse on, on the weird spidery looking thing? Yeah, that's a real thing. It's right in that box over there. Oh, it's, it doesn't make any any noise. <laughs> it doesn't actually make any noise. All right. So Joni is going to wrangle the creature out of the box. Uh, they look really scary, but they can literally do nothing to you. Aww. And you will be able to you will be able to hold it later if you would like. So if you're the brave soul that wants to hold it, uh, you can come up after the presentation, and we got you covered. <laughs> So we're just going to start off with a um, with a few different examples of aliens because um, now we talked about like insects and some more insect morphologies. Now we're going to show you some aliens, and now after we've talked about some of these parts, we hope that you'll be able to see where these aliens got their inspiration. I actually don't know how to pronounce any of these because you. Geonosians. I'm not. I'm not. Geonosians. Geonosians. Yeah. So. Geonos, yeah, bug, the bugs, like the bugs, the bugs. Uh, for all you Star Wars fans, a lot of aliens in Star Wars are inspired um, by insects. So their wings, their eyes. Um, if you want to keep going, yeah. you can kind of see like things that kind of have like this hardened armor, like an exoskeleton. Um, again, we see things with these big uh, compound eyes, things that are like antennae. It's really fancy ornamentation. So insects have claws. They're called yeah. Tarsi. So you'll see, like this guy actually has something pretty similar to a lot of insect feet. They're called tarsal claws, and especially on the Australian spiny insects, which are over there somewhere. This one, or right here. You'll actually, when you get up close, you can actually see these claws. So you can see this inspiration. And then for we had to add Star Trek in, of course. <laughs> so actually, Star Trek not only has a lot of the aliens, let the way that they look have inspirations from insects, but also a lot of behavior. So um, like mind control or like the spaceship. So a lot of things have elements that you see within arthropods. And then of course, you know, we have to add our animated aliens in as well. So these are from Wreck-It Ralph, if you remember. Yeah, uh, the cybugs in the in the game. I forget, I forget her name now, but um, so in the game we had to like destroy all of the, all the cybugs and get the egg. 
So it's not just the aliens, it's also the spaceships. Um, so here's this Indian insectoid spaceship. And also from Avengers, I felt like these spaceships had a lot of insect characteristics. They were like a combination between a fish and an insect that just got smashed together. <laughs> yeah, and the thing with this is that, so it's, um, it's really amazing to, to have um, inspiration for things like this. And insects have been around a long time. They've been around longer than we have, but um, to us, they are different. So the way that they look and their behaviors, like it isn't like our behavior. So it's really, um, it's good to pull for uh, different things that you normally don't think of as an everyday type of behavior or structure. So we do perceive it as alien because it isn't something that we personally identify with. Yeah, they're not like fluffy. They don't. They don't have cute puppy dog eyes. So because they're they're not in like the mammalian bird category, they're like they're people automatically put them in the scary, you gross. Let's make crazy monsters out of them. And then a lot of robots as well are just based off of insects. So here's the here's the matrix. Yeah, and so we'll talk a little bit. That that is also yeah. based on real biology, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then later the sentinels as well are very insect-like and and a lot of times, like a lot of insects make noise, but they don't make the noise that you would expect in movies. There's kind of like this weird calling. <laughs> And like you know, like the like the insect roboty soundy noise. There are a lot of insects that make noise, but none of them make that kind of noise. Yeah, that is completely made up. <laughs> but they so yeah, they they make noises in a variety of ways. They will um, stridulate, so rubbing body parts together. That's like your crickets and your grasshoppers. Um, they hiss. Some insects hiss by squeezing out air from the sides of their body. So like hissing cockroaches. Like hissing cockroaches, because insects the way that they breathe is they have these holes on the side of their body called spiracles. So a lot of that's via diffusion. Um, but some insects can squeeze out air. And then you have things like the cicadas that have an actually specialized organ that vibrates to make the sound. And actually, there's one insect insect that uses its agus, um, which is a penis. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a true biology term, so <laughs> biological terms, but they, they do make noise in a variety of ways. Um, one of the loudest one, the loudest animal by body side is an insect that lives in the bottom of rivers and is the one that uses ADA is to rub against his abdomen. So that, the articles that came out of that were amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every, I, we've had some emails about that too. So again, you can always ask us questions at Ask an Entomologist, but someone was like, is this real? This just doesn't, this is too crazy. It's like, too crazy. And then so then you're like on Google, you're like, okay, Adiagus of like this bug and you like have pictures. So, yeah, it's great. Yeah, Adiagus is, it's, you know, I mean, you don't have to go into incognito mode using that term, <laughs> but you know. Spell it. <laughs> <laughs> Spell it. Um, a-E-D-A-G-U-S, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that sounds about right, but I'm dyslexic, so I, I don't know. I'm going to go with Nancy and say yeah. Yes. Yeah, good job, Nancy. So video games are no um, exception to being inspired by uh, insects. My One of my lab mates is like, oh, please put this in your presentation. Please put this in your presentation. So like, I don't play Starfinder, but there is a creature that looks like um, a bug, and... Not only does it look like a bug, um, it has a cool like structure that we see in um, dragonfly nymphs. So there's this structure called a labial mask that not only yeah, that's an insect eating a fish. Take that vertebrates. Yeah. <laughs> so there's actually another aquatic insect that can catch fish, and they have like venom in their like mouth piercing sucking structure. It's called a water bug, Bell stomatidae, and they. Um, will inject venom so that will kill snakes too sometimes. yeah I, I did see one take down like a like a salamander once it was pretty crazy but so this I uh, character over here um, if you look at its mouth it oh, like opens kind of all the way down and that is based on this labial mask which is one of the mouth parts of the dragonfly and of course like we have to show you a video of how this thing works right so here's a zoomed in picture and it just literally like like pops down and opens and grabs it. If you're ever um, by a stream or a river and you, you see these, you can actually like use your, if you catch them, you can use your finger to kind of like- You can open out. that structure up. They can't do anything to you, 
they just look really scary, which is why our aliens are based off of them. And they were eating mosquito larvae. Yeah, they, yeah, they're eating mosquito larvae. So the bigger one, so um, dragonflies and damselflies, they start off as small nymphs, and then they go through several molts in the nymph stage, and then they'll emerge as the adult. So they have to. They start off small, so they have to eat small things, and there are just some species that are bigger than others. But you can still find like dragonfly nymphs in the water about that big, and they're kind of like they're like this kind of brownie mucky color, so you wouldn't see them normally. But if you know what you're looking for, you can dig them out of ponds. If you have like a little pan, like or like a little like plastic container, you can like put them in there and like sift through and find find them pretty easy actually. Yeah. And then, oh, personal favorite, the next one, yes, demons in the dust. So this little critter here is an antlion. It is a type of neuropteran. And neuroptera is an order of insects that includes things like green lacewings, the beaded lacewing, which I talked about at the farting panel yesterday. Um, and this critter here is um, the, the immature, the larval form of the adult um, antlion. And there have been a lot of things within science fiction that have been inspired by this. Um, there's an old book called Demons in the Dust that was um, written by, oh, what's his name? I should know. He's an ant guy, but it's, it's escaping my mind. But, um, excuse me? No, it wasn't E.O. Wilson, it was his predecessor. Um, and I, it, but anyway, so in Star Wars, the Sarlacc Pit, everyone, I'm pretty sure, who knows what the Sarlacc Pit is? Yeah. 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 So that is a real thing that happens in real life <laughs> with these critters. So they have little, um, they're in the, the ground with a little pit and they wait for things like ants. So ant lions, ant lions. as the name might suggest. So, yeah, as the name would suggest. And here Nancy has a, um, a picture. So I have a video of it. So an ant will come down and fall into the pit. And that is the ant lion heads bashing the ant and killing it. And they have the, the mandibles. They look like they're chewing mandibles, but they're not. They're basically hollow straws where they stab the, where they stab the, the ant and suck out the juices. Yeah, and then bring the ant carcass down into the pit. So that is where the sarlacc creature is, is based off of. These guys also have a, another interesting behavior, and if the ant is not falling well enough into the sand trap, they will actually flick sand at the ant to knock it down into the pit. Yeah, and uh, I, when I was a kid, I used to like go and get them out, and they do bite, and it hurts. So they're very, very ferocious little predators, and um, there are some ants that try to get around this, like trap jaw ants. Well, um, they have like these mandibles that move extremely fast. Um, they mainly use them for catching their prey, but what trap jet ants do is they'll put their um, mandibles on the ground and launch themselves backwards. So it's another cool little biology thing, but most do not escape the ant lion. And then we'll do a little bit about mind control. We have a couple examples of this. If you thought this was purely science fiction, you were wrong. Science fiction ripped it off of insect biology. Um, so first off, we have the, this is from The Last of Us. Did anyone play The Last of Us? Yes, the game was so good. Um, I actually met the, the scientific advisor for the Cordyceps fungus. Uh, they actually did a, you know, a pretty decent job on, on the Cordyceps fungus if it, if it were to attack people. And so they actually got a, a biologist who studies the Cordyceps fungus to be the scientific advisor for the video game, which is super awesome. But you took this picture, so you yeah, can talk about it. Yeah, so this, uh, I, there are documentaries about the cordyceps in um, South America with leaf cutter ants and other arthropods. So there are, for most arthropods, especially in the tropics, there is a cordyceps that will infect them. This one was actually taken here in Georgia on, at, on South Pole Island. That's a carpenter ant that had been parasitized by a cordyceps. Um, not the same as the one in South America because that group is it's it's uh, not very well described yet. So there's some problems with the taxonomy, but it basically it is a fungus that affects it. And the way that this works is once an ant 
uh, inhales the spores from this fungus. And remember the ant is inhaling them from the sides of its body because that's where it breathes. It doesn't have a nose like we do. Yeah, so it's not via, uh, it's, it's yeah, the sides of the body. So that's how it's getting in. So when the ant is breathing and gets spores and infected, uh, the fungus can manipulate, it starts to manipulate its behavior. So once the fungus is ready to fruit, that fruiting body that you see out of the head, it Manipulate send death, death spores the out. Death spores. Release the death spores. Yeah. So they hijack hijack its uh, nervous system and make it crawl up a branch or a twig or something that's high up and makes it bite down. This is all the fungus doing this to the ant, and then it starts to fruit from the head of the ant to thus hopefully infect other ants. And it this is so so it doesn't just Ants know this because once an ant notices a, an ant acting funny, they will try to make them take them very far away. So the ants do know, and they do freak out, kind of like we would, like, oh my gosh, there's zombies, there's or, a, yeah, there's this alien that's about to like take over my brain, like, oh my gosh. So the ants will freak out and take them far, far away, and like the dump them somewhere. Because if that ant, like that fruiting body, gets off near the colony, it'll wipe out the whole colony. So they'll just pick it up and just dump it as far as possible. There's a species of cordyceps for like almost every species of insect from what we can tell. Um, each one seems to very, be very host specific. There's a lot of biology that's happening here. First of all, you have to curb the host's immune system and then you have to alter bi uh, brain chemistry of that organism. So you have a lot of complicated chemistry going on. So pretty much each species of cordyceps attacks a different species of insect and they are species specific. And for pop culture references, so Pokemon Paris and Parasect are actually uh, are zombie insects that are being taken over by parasitic fungus. And actually the creators of Pokemon were inspired by insects. They were amateur entomologists that like to go out and catch beetle larvae and rear them out and collect. So. And they actually created Pokemon because it was the creator of Pokemon and he was like, oh, I remember catching bugs when I was a kid and I really loved it. And now these kids in the city don't have that same experience. So I'm going to make this game so these kids in the city can get the joy of like learning and collecting, collecting insects. So the mind games continue. We're not done. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is what this is what Joni works on. Yeah. So again, you, you see a lot of host manipulation and mind control in insects. So this is actually what my dissertation is on. These are decapitating flies, and they also can modify the behavior of the ant. So the way that this works is this fly is an adult. So flies are like they're Whole metabolism insects. So they're like butterflies. They're, they're like butterflies. Less pretty. Complete metamorphosizing insects. So basically, what all that means is that the immatures look completely different from the adult. You have an egg, a larva, a pupa, and then the adult. So the way that these flies develop is that the adult fly will lay an egg in the fire ant worker's thorax, and once it becomes successfully uh, ovoposited, so once the egg is in there it starts to modify the ant's behavior immediately. So worker ants, usually what they'd like to do is forage. So um, once they reach a certain point, there is division of labor within the colony, but they will forage. And what this fly does is it causes it not to forage. It makes it go back in the nest where it's nice and safe and happy and warm and everything's being taken care of. It's nice incognito within the nest. And once it's getting ready, once this fly is going through its stages, its larval and stars, it starts to move up towards the head. The brain is the last thing that it eats, right? Causes the ant, this is also called zombie ant behavior. The fly causes the ant to leave the nest far away because it would be very bad for the ant to emerge within a fire ant nest. I'm sure, who's been stung by a fire ant? Yeah, so they're very, very vicious little critters. So it would be good to come out there. So they cause them, the, the ant to wander far away, this is on the ant. Then the fly secretes a substance that dissolves the attachments of the head from the body. The head comes off and then the fly emerges and you can see it right here. So, so they're like literally decapitating flies. <laughs> this is real life. <laughs> 
So here, and this, this biology happens in wasps, flies, there's beetles that do this. Uh, here's a, an organism that I actually studied and worked on. The little green thing being stabbed violently is a P. aphid. And the little thing doing the stabbing is uh, a type of braconid wasp. And she is in the action of laying the egg inside, inside the aphid. And very similar to the story of the decapitating flies, um, the egg will develop, the larva will eat the aphid from the inside out, and then burst from the body cavity. Yeah, not only that, but the female wasp, once her ovipositor hits that whatever it's parasitizing, she can tell if it's sick, if it's been parasitized already. All this information just by touching it. Right, so if it if she touches the aphid and it's sick or it's been parasitized, or even actually some of these aphids have a bacteria that protects them against the egg. The bacteria will actually kill the wasp eggs, egg, saving the aphid. Um, she will just be like, nope, and then, you know, leave and sting a different one. Okay. And all of that, she's getting all of that information from uh, sensors on the actual stinger and that science is still being worked out so come back in three years <laughs> this is a caterpillar you can actually see this here um, the big kind of thing that all of the little white things are attached to is a hornworm caterpillar or what's left of it and on top of that are all of these little wasp cocoons. So some insects emerge directly as an adult, like the decapitating flies, and some emerge as a cocoon and then emerge as the adult wasp. What's interesting about this story is that those cocoons are on the outside of the body. However, there have been a few wasp larvae that have sacrificed themselves, don't complete their development, and stay inside the caterpillar and hook into the caterpillar's nervous system. So when something like another wasp, because you can have a wasp that will parasitize the, the cocoons on the outside of the caterpillar. So you can have a whole ecosystem just sitting on the outside of this caterpillar. So obviously your wasp cocoons are, um, you know, just sitting there. So they don't have a lot of defense. So to prevent against other parasitoids from putting their eggs in the parasitoids that put their eggs inside the caterpillar, the first parasitoids have hung in there, hooked into the caterpillar's nervous system, and if anything touches the caterpillar, the caterpillar will wiggle around and headbang and knock them off. We don't know how it gets decided who stays behind. Um, it just, there seems to be a few that stay behind and we're not sure on the science of that either. And we're also not sure on the science of how they're doing the mind control. So this is, this is like super sci-fi, like even in, in science because we're like how, we don't even know how this is yeah. happening and how they're controlling the biology. Like the substance that these flies secrete, you don't even know what it is, that's like part of my project. So there's like a lot of unanswered questions and not only that, that there are so many different types of parasitoids that do little different things, like variations in the parasitism and um, they're, they're just very understudied. So, but there's even more, we're not done yet. <laughs> So this is a really great story of the emerald jewel wasp. The emerald jewel wasp is coming out of this cockroach body. So if you ever thought you would never feel bad for a cockroach, maybe maybe after this next video you will. Yeah, it gets worse. This is this you think okay, that that kind of stinks for the roach, but yeah, okay. So this is the emerald jewel wasp. She completes her entire development inside the cockroach. Um and so what she does is she will wrestle the cockroach, so here she is like wrestling the cockroach, and she will deliver a sting into the back of the head. And that sting is a type of venom that specifically shuts off the dopamine response. So it basically just makes the, makes the caterpillar, or makes the cockroach not want to run away. It's, it has complete free will. It could run away if it wanted to, as it should. Um, but that that first sting just knocks that part out, so the cockroach becomes completely complacent. And instead of being like, "There's a wasp, I should run away," it just sits there and it's like, "Hello." Yeah, and there's some parasitoids and parasites that will 
So normally you'll have insects that will want to run away from a predator, but they will have them want to get eaten by the predator so that they can complete their life cycle and their other hosts. Yeah, so she doesn't quite go that far. She, she does just, not go that far. She just knocks out the response that tells the cockroach that you should be running away from this thing that's about to eat you. There's like these little nodules on the stinger and she has to sting a very specific part of the brain to get that to work. We don't know how, how exactly that's done. We don't know the chemicals that she's using to do that, but we do know that it, affects, uh, that it attacks the, the dopamine centers of the brain. So after she's done that, and she takes a quick break because wrestling a cockroach is hard, she will clip the antennae and take a snack of its blood. So she'll clip the antennae and drink the blood that's coming out of the antennae. And then after she's had her fill, she will literally walk the cockroach like a dog to a burrow. <laughs> and so here she is, she's like gonna fill up her burrow. She'll just walk it right in there. The cockroach, mind you, can, it can run away if it wanted to, it just doesn't want to. Can we call that the arena? The arena. <laughs> the arena. And she will make a burrow. She'll drag the cockroach or walk it like a dog into the burrow. She'll seal up the burrow and before she sealed up the burrow, she'll lay her eggs on it. So the cockroach is still alive. It's just hanging out in there, slowly starving to death, having wasp larvae eat it slowly. And the reason we think that the wasps are doing that is that it's keeping the flesh fresh, right? You don't want to feed your babies rotting flesh. So if you can keep it alive and not running away, then that's, that's, the, perfect, that's the perfect solution for your wasp larvae that, that don't really have legs and can't really do anything. And there are a lot of wasps that do this to spiders that will also keep them alive and long enough for the, to keep the food fresh for the, um, in the developing insect that they've... Are these local bugs? Yes, yes, you can find these all here yep. in Georgia, in North America, all over the world. Doesn't that make you feel better? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And so um, this is the the cockroach and when when the wasp is emerging out of its body. Is it just one larva? Yes. And that is a good question too, because there are some where you have multiple within a host. Right. So this wasp is just it's just one per cockroach, but like I was showing you back here, and like that caterpillar has like what fifty to hundred ish cocoons on it. So it really depends on the biology. Yeah. And actually, we're like straight into questions now. So questions. Okay. Yes. We